The Bodhisattva Statues, Sutra, Ananda. These good people's emotional love and desire are withered and dry. The sense organs and sense objects no longer match, and so the residual habits do not continue to arise. Commentary: Shakyamuni Buddha Consent. Ananda. These good people's emotional love and desire are withered and dry. The people referred to are the ones who have passed through the three gradual stages just discussed. Withered and dry means that they have no thoughts of emotional desire and love. The sense organs and sense objects no longer match. The six sense organs no longer seek to match up with the six sense objects, and so the residual habits do not continue to arise. Residual habits refers to the slight bit of ignorance that these people still harbor. Since the ignorance is so slight, it does not continue to increase. Sutra, by means of their complete wisdom, they understand that attachments of the mind are false. The bright perfection of their wisdom nature shines throughout the ten directions, and this initial wisdom is called the stage of dry wisdom. Commentary: The slight bit of ignorance that still remains does not grow and increase. The comic obstacles are also very few. And so, by means of their complete wisdom, they understand that attachments of the mind are false. Their minds become as clear as emptiness itself. Their own natures experience the perfection of wisdom. Complete wisdom means they don't have any other false thoughts. The thoughts in their mind are brought forth from wisdom. The bright perfection of their wisdom nature shines throughout the ten directions. The nature of their wisdom is light and full, and this initial wisdom is called the stage of dry wisdom. Since emotional love and desire are dried up, all that's left is wisdom. This stage of dry wisdom is also called the initial thought of vara. Vara means indestructible. This stage is the first step towards the point of being like vara. What follows is a discussion of the fifty-five stages of a Bodhisattva, the ten faiths, the ten dwellings, the ten conducts, the ten transferences, the four levels of augmenting practice, heat, summit, patience, foremost in the world, the ten grounds, equal enlightenment. Sutra. Although the habits of desire are initially dried up. They still have not merged with the first common flow of Dharma water. Commentary: Although the habits of desire and emotional love are initially dried up, they still have not merged with the first common flow of Dharma water. Here, the flow of Dharma water does not refer to Dharma which is spoken; it is the water of Dharma that flows forth from the self nature. But at this point in their development, they have not merged with the water of genuine wisdom. The ten faiths. Sutra. Then, with this mind centered on the middle, they enter the flow where wonderful perfection reveals itself. From the truth of that wonderful perfection, there repeatedly arise wonders of truth. They always dwell in the wonder of faith until all false thinking is completely eliminated, and all the middle way is totally true. This is called the mind that resides in faith. Commentary: This begins the discussion on the ten faiths. The mind that resides in faith, the mind that resides in mindfulness, the mind that resides in vigor, the mind that resides in wisdom. The mind that resides in samadhi, the mind that resides in irreversibility, the mind that resides in protecting the dharma, the mind that resides in making transferences, the mind that resides in the precepts, the mind that resides in vows. Then, with this mind centered on the middle, they enter the flow where wonderful perfection reveals itself. This mind refers to the mind at the level of dry wisdom, the initial vara mind. 
they use this mind to enter the flow of the Dharma, Dharma, the Buddha Dharma, and they reach the state where wonderful perfection reveals itself, where it opens out in abundance. One reaches the principle and substance of true suchness from the truth of that wonderful perfection. There repeatedly arise wonders of truth. In the wonderful perfection of the true suchness of the self nature, truths within truths come forth. They always dwell in the wonder of faith until all false thinking is completely eliminated and the middle way is totally true. Their belief becomes more and more subtle and wonderful. Always dwell means that they will not waver, they will not change their minds. Their faith is constant. At that point, all false thinking goes away without exception. Even if they wanted to have false thoughts, the false thoughts just wouldn't arise. That is because false thoughts are helped out by ignorance. With false thoughts come love and desire. But now love and desire have been dried up and only a little ignorance remains. So that quite naturally, they don't have false thoughts. Why do you have false thinking? It is because you still have love and desire. There are things that you are greedy for. The desires compel you to think about this and that so that your mind is always climbing on conditions. If people didn't have any greed, they wouldn't have any false thinking. At this point in their conservation, these people don't have false thinking. When that happens, one attains the nature of the principle of the middle way. It is totally true, which means that there is no love and desire, no greedy false thoughts. This is called the mind that resides in faith. This is the first of these ten positions. One brings forth genuine faith and dwells in it. Sutra, when true faith is clearly understood, then perfect penetration is total and the three aspects of skandhas, places, and realms are no longer obstructions. Then all their habits throughout the innumerable compass of past and future, during which they abandon bodies and receive bodies, appear to them now in the present moment. These good people can remember everything and forget nothing. This is called the mind that resides in mindfulness. Commentary prior to this stage, when they were residing in the mind of faith, they cultivated the middle way, that wonderful perfection in the principle which one neither enters into nor departs from. Now, since they are replete with faith, true faith is clearly understood. Once one has true faith, one can gain true wisdom. Clear understanding then refers to that true wisdom. Then perfect penetration is total, and the three aspects of skandhas, places, and realms are no longer obstructions. Not only do they accomplish the perfect penetration of the sense organs, but of everything else as well. The five skandhas of form, feeling, thought, activity, and consciousness. The twelve places of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind together with forms, sounds, smells, tastes, tangible objects, and dramas, and the 18 realms, which include the six sense organs, the six sense objects, and the consciousnesses which connect them. That is the eye consciousness, the ear consciousness, the nose consciousness, the tongue consciousness, the body consciousness, and the mind consciousness. Once you obtain perfect penetration, these things can no longer hinder you. Then all the habits throughout the innumerable compass of past and future, during which they abandon bodies and receive bodies, appear to them now in the present moment. For time beyond calculation, they have been undergoing rebirth, and will continue to undergo rebirth, birth after birth, death upon death. And in each one of those lives, they have different habits. In one life, they got into the habit of drinking wine. In another life, they were in the habit of smoking. In another life, they were habitual gamblers. Another life found them with habits of lust. And in another life, they killed. Another life made them into thieves. 
in one life, they got into the habit of lying. In general, life after life, they developed habits that led them to do all kinds of bad things. That's looking at the bad habits, but there are also good habits. In one life, they got into the habit of bowing to the Buddhas. In another life, they habitually recited the Shurakama mantra. In one life, they had the habit of listening to the explanation of the Shurakama Sutra. In another life, another life, they habitually listened to the Lotus Sutra. In general, throughout all those lives, in so many k a m p a s they walked many paths. As a result, they had accumulated a tremendous number of habits. But now, just like a movie, all those habits appear before them. This good people can remember everything and forget nothing. These good people who are cultivating the way can bring it all to mind. They can remember it all. When they attain that state, they never forget. That means they always have their mind on what's happening. They are always mindful of those causes and conditions. This is called the mind that resides in mindfulness, the second of the ten faiths. Sutra, when the wonderful perfection is completely true, that essential truth brings about a transformation. They go beyond the beginningless habits to reach the one essential brightness. Relying solely on this essential brightness, they progress toward true purity. This is called the mind of v i g o Commentary: When the wonderful perfection is completely true, that essential truth brings about a transformation. They go beyond the beginningless habits to reach the one essential brightness, which is wisdom. Relying solely on this essential brightness, they progress toward true purity. The v i g o takes them to a place of true purity, which is devoid of any defilement. This is called the mind of v i g o the mind that resides in v i g o Sutra: The essence of the mind reveals itself as total wisdom. This is called the mind that resides in wisdom. Commentary: When one has progressed until the mind is truly pure. Then the essence of the mind reveals itself as total wisdom. The mind is clear and understood, which means one has some genuine wisdom. Total wisdom means that there is not the least bit of random thinking remaining. The stupidity and false thoughts are all gone. Remember that this was described above, in the passage on the first dwelling of the mind, where it said that. All false thinking is completely eliminated. This is called the mind that resides in wisdom. This is the dwelling of the mind of faith in wisdom. Sutra, as the wisdom and brightness are held steadfast, a profound stillness pervades. The stage at which the majesty of this stillness becomes constant and solid is called the mind that resides in samadhi. Commentary: As the wisdom and brightness are held steadfast, a profound stillness pervades. This means that you must hold on to the light of wisdom and not let it go slack. Then there is a profound stillness that extends throughout the d h a m a r i u m The stage at which the majesty of this stillness becomes constant and solid is called the mind that resides in samadhi. The profound stillness represents what is tranquil and eternally illumining, and the majesty of this stillness represents what is illumining and eternally tranquil. Solid here refers to the solidifying of the water of wisdom. It had been shallower before; now it deepens. Solid represents samadhi power. At this point, one will not be moved. One would not say. That looks good, and run in that direction, and then say, "But that looks even better," and run to the next thing. One would not be always pursuing something better if one had somebody power. One would not run about hither and thither. The wind out of the east would not bend one westward, nor would a west wind blow one eastward. There, that just means. 
that one would not be moved by the eight winds. In order to tell about the eight winds, we must talk about the famous Song Dynasty scholar and poet Su Tung Po. He was known as Layman Tung Po and he carried on a dialogue with Diana Master Fo Yin, the former lead on the south bank of the Long River, Yang Tse a Chen Chiang, and the latter on the north bank of the river. The poet Su Tung Po meditated and cultivated, and one day in meditation, he saw a state that moved him to write a verse. The verse went, I bow my head to the god among gods, and a ray of light illumines the great thousand worlds. The eight winds cannot move me, as I sit aloft, a purple, a purple golden lotus. The god among gods refers to the Buddha. The poet claimed that when he bowed to the Buddha, he emitted a light that went throughout the universe. The eight winds are praise, ridicule, suffering, bliss, benefit, destruction, gain, loss. Praise is someone saying things like, You are an excellent student. You really apply yourself. You have a fine personality and a good moral character. But you shouldn't look upon praise as something good, because if you are moved by it, you just prove that you don't have any samadhi power. The eight winds are difficult for cultivators to bear. Ridicule means to trade or tease or use sarcasm. is to use words in such a way as to break a person down. It may sound like praise, but is thick with sarcasm. This wind can cause one to lose one's temper. How can you treat me like that is a, a typical reaction. Suffering in all its manifold aspects is also one of the winds as is bliss. You may feel good, but you should not think that is a great thing, because as soon as your mind moves to acknowledge the pleasure, a wind has moved you. Benefit refers to something that will help you out. Destruction means something unbeneficial which is bad for you. Gain refers to getting something lost to losing it. Getting something makes you happy. Losing something upsets you. For instance, a person buys the latest model of a very fancy radio. He's so taken with it that he even dreams about it at night. Or maybe it's a camera or a telescope. In general, just imagine the thing that you are most fond of. Buying it is what is meant by gain. But once you have it, of course, other people find it attractive too. And who would have guessed that someone would wait until you are a bit careless and steal it from you? At that point, your ignorance arises and you are afflicted by your loss. Thus to be moved by the eight winds, but Su Tung Po said that the eight winds did not move him as he sat aloft a purple golden lotus. He had his servant take the poem to Chen Master Fo Yin for his critique. Chen Master Fo Yin scribbled two words across the poem. The two words were very meaningful, but Su Tung Po couldn't handle them. He exploded in a rage as soon as he glanced at them. What were the words? Fat, fat. Sudung Pua grabbed the poem, threw on his coat, and stormed across the river to confront Chen Master Fo Yin. What kind of bad-mouthed monk are you? He demanded of the Chen Master. What right do you have to scold people like that? But you said the eight winds would not move you. Chen Master Fo Yin replied calmly. How is it that my two little fats have blown you all the way across the river? Thinking it over, Su Tung Po saw how right the Chen Master was, and so he hung his head and went back home. Sutra, the light of Samadhi emits brightness. When the essence of the brightness enters deeply within, they only advance and never retreat. This is called the mind of irreversibility. Commentary Once the mind resides in samadhi, the light of samadhi emits brightness. When the essence of the brightness enters 
deeply within these good people who are cultivating. They only advance and never retreat, since they understand their only intent is to progress, and they never turn around and go back. The reason they are irreversible is that they truly and genuinely understand. They have real wisdom. This is called the mind of irreversibility, the mind of faith that never retreats. So, child, when the progress of their minds is secure and they hold their minds and protect them without loss, they connect with the life breath of the first commons of the ten directions. This is called the mind that protects the Dharma. Commentary When the progress of their mindful of their minds is secure, they go ever forward, they never fly off the handle. They are firm and at peace, and they hold their minds and protect them without loss, so that their minds never retreat. They then they connect with the life breath of the first commons of the ten directions. When one reaches the point of irreversibility, the energy force of the Buddha unites with one's own. This is called the mind that protects the Dharma. This means that the Buddhas protect you. And you protect the Buddha Dharma. With the Buddha's protection, you can accomplish your karma in the way. With your protection, the Buddha Dharma can spread and grow. So this is the mind of faith that protects the Dharma. Sutra protecting the light of enlightenment. They can use this wonderful force to return to the Buddha's light of compassion and to come back to stand firm with the Buddha. It is like two mirrors that are set facing one another, so that between them the, the exquisite images interreflect and enter into one another layer upon layer. This is called the mind of transference. Commentary protecting the lines of enlightenment. They can use this wonderful force to join with the life breath of the Buddha is a kind of enlightenment. When protected, this enlightenment is replete with wisdom and intelligence which is without loss. This pupil can return to the Buddha's light of compassion and to come back to stand firm with the Buddha. With this subtle wonderful power, you can unite with the Buddha's bright compassion. Your life breath and light interact with the Buddha's life breath and light. Like the two mirrors that are set facing one another, so that between them, the exquisite images interreflect and enter into one another layer upon layer. When two mirrors are placed opposite one another, their images interreflect repeatedly. They display infinite layers of interreflection. This is called the mind of transference, the mind of faith that dwells in transference of merit. Sutra, with this secret interplay of light, they obtain the Buddha's eternal solidity and unsurpassed wonderful purity. Dwelling in the unconditioned, they know no loss or dissipation. This is called the mind that resides in precepts. Commentary, with this secret interplay of light, they obtain the Buddha's eternal solidity and unsurpassed wonderful purity. At this point, there is a hidden connection between the light of your mind and the light of the Buddha's mind. That is what is meant by the secret interplay of light. The light of your heart reaches to the Buddha's light, and the Buddha's light reaches to your heart. After the light of the Buddha has entered your heart, it returns to the Buddha. After the light of your mind has entered the Buddha's mind, it returns to your own mind. This interplay of light goes full circle. One thus obtains a constant illumination from the Buddha. In fact, one simply becomes one with the Buddha. This purity is incomparable. Nothing surpasses it. Dwelling in the unconditioned, they know no loss or dissipation. One has obtained the unconditioned dharmas, and no loss can occur. This is called the mind that resides in precepts. Sutra abiding in the precepts with self-mastery. They can roam throughout the ten directions, going anywhere they wish. This is called the mind that re resides in vows. 
commentary abiding in the precepts of the unsurpassed vital bright jeweled precepts with self mastery and spiritual penetrations they can roam throughout the ten directions going anywhere they wish such spiritual penetrations come with freedom and ease there's no need for mental exertion no need to set one's mind to it in order to be able to go anywhere in the ten directions they can go anywhere they wish without any hindrance this is called the mind that three sides involves whatever wish or vow you make can be fulfilled